Hi everyone, this is Jason coming to you from CIS 2019. With me now is Quinn on Twitter at MidEarthCrypto and of DecentralizedAmerica.com. Quinn, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, my first question is generally the question that I ask most people in this space is how did you first find crypto? Um, so I think I got started in 2016-ish. I live in South America and at the time remittance was a big issue using Western Union. You know, I'm sending money back and forth between my wife or my mom's family here and it just became, I sat down one day and realized how much I was actually spending on the cost of their fees. You know, the 10 to 15%, depending if I was sending dollars to dollars or pesos to dollars. And so um, that's what got me interested. I, you know, I knew of Bitcoin, I had heard of Bitcoin, but not in the capacity to solve that particular cross border payment solution issue. And so, um, yeah, that's what I, I bought some, I was sending it. And then when the spike started to happen, you know, I was holding Bitcoin and just watching it go up. And then I bought a little bit more and, and at 2000, I really kind of loaded in. And uh, that was that was what helped me out for 2018. I, I spent all of 2017 thinking I'm just this investing genius, you know, and uh, I ended up getting completely destroyed in uh, in January, February of, of 18 with the yeah. all crash. And so yeah. that um, kind of shifted my course. I was still very, very encouraged and like interested and just enthralled by the technology, but was new and obviously just gotten burned bad from what I thought was like this incredible run up. But um, right. yeah, so that, I just went to went into the book space and started learning then. Nice, nice, nice. So tell me about decentralized America. Um, what do you what are you doing with that? And is it something that is expanding to other mediums besides just a website? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so it's basically like, a, like an adoption tour that we're working on here in the States. Mm -hmm. And we started off by going to baseball games, parks, any major like, you know, audience arenas where we're going to have a lot of people that we can go and talk to They're especially happy people you know people that are going to be walking right. around and uh, ask them about bitcoin offered them dollars gift cards or bitcoin and really ran into the problem of finding that people don't know or they don't care enough to actually invest the time to download a wallet and so we tried to pivot and that pivot is in the form of decentralized america which is going to be a an education alliance with tron stellar and a few other companies where we go around to schools and just pitch you know education basically blockchain solutions and why it matters because that's what you've been doing for the last few days and yeah. last few weeks actually you've been traveling around to different schools it's been exciting yeah so tron's really kind of been the one that spearheaded the initiative to start adoption at the the college level and um that was i was at usc two days ago and did a speech there we'll go to we have three more schools uh, scheduled for the month of october and november okay. and so central florida and georgia state university berkeley we're working on but they're kind of still funny about tron so okay. i think we're going to create a a general blockchain pitch that has nothing specific to Tron for that school. And, um, and that's fine. You know, I think that the fact that they're invested in the future of blockchain education without it having to come from a Tron lens, you know, is good because it just shows that they're wanting to progress the space in the community. Nice. So tell me a little bit about crypto in South America. Um, we hear about Venezuela and we hear about, um, Brazil, um, people moving towards crypto in those areas. Uh, you're in Ecuador, correct? Ecuador. Yeah, so we're right next to Venezuela, actually. So how, how has Ecuador um, and crypto, how, how has Ecuador moved towards crypto? Have you noticed any? None yet. So uh, Bitcoin's technically uh, illegal in Ecuador still. No. It's completely illegal. It's one of the very few countries around the world that has the more strict laws. Um, but in Venezuela, we have a border region that's received a million plus migrants in the last year. So we have a million Venezuelans that have come over into Ecuador with their Bitcoin. Now it's not as prominent as society, as like the news wants to make us believe they're, they're right. not using Bitcoin at every store. But I think what's, what's encouraging is the fact that it's kind of too late for Venezuela, to be honest. Hyperinflation has already occurred, but in other places where it's just starting like Argentina, you're seeing mass floods into Bitcoin. Like their local Bitcoin transactions are through the roof, 300% basically. And I think we'll see that continue to grow so as far as like South America, what's going to have to happen, I think you need a major nation, like one of these leaders of the Latin American countries. So Argentina, Chile, Brazil, we need one of them to make the switch and lead the way for the rest of the countries to follow. Right. But we, we've heard recently of some issues in Ecuador um, related to the IMF. 
So do you think that that might be something that spurs people to just look at crypto? Maybe, absolutely. So um, the country just had a revolution, basically, a one-week revolution coup where they stormed the capital city because of oil subsidies, mm -hmm. the, the removal of oil subsidies. So basically the price of gasoline doubled overnight. Right. And, um, and that was due to the IMF's pressure on the country or on the president. Right. And I think that, I don't know if it means that we're ready for Bitcoin yet, but I think the fact that the country pulled together that hard and the indigenous population was able to, you know, peacefully have a resolution that they wanted. They, it worked. I mean, they stopped everything. All the gas stations were empty and buses, vans, trucks, taxis weren't running. You know, the airports were closed and the whole country shut down for a week. So that the fact that they were able to achieve that and then peacefully get a resolution to move forward, it's encouraging that the IMF isn't going to be able to have that strong arm as much as they might have used to be. So, right, right. Well, we're seeing also just government bodies in general flexing their muscle when yeah. it comes to finance. Like the letters, I don't know if you read them, but the... Uh, two U.S. senators sending the letters to Visa, MasterCard. It's like we're in this draconian law right now where it, innovation is scary for some reason. I mean, I've read documents that politicians put out before, but this was the first one to me that screamed extortion. Right. It was gangster. Okay. How they mafioso. said it was mafioso. Yes, yes. It was basically, that's a nice story you have there. Be ashamed if something happened to it. This is what they did. And they didn't do it in a backroom way. No, they that's, put it on yeah. the internet for everybody to see. It's 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 challenging almost, right? Like this is what's going to happen. We drew the line in the sand. Right. Let's go. Right. Well, and, yeah. yeah. And I, I think we mentioned the other day. You know, the idea of trying to Libra is a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, in in theory, this idea of, of a world currency that's connected by the internet is awesome. And Facebook would be the one that could do it if they weren't with plagued with all those like histories of Correct. leaks and you know. The, yeah. data, uh, the data leak for, no, it's not even, it was yeah. selling the data to selling the data Cambridge, to Cambridge Analytica. Analytica. Yeah, so right. things like that have kind of shown that they aren't in a position to be trusted with that information. But I think we talked about it yesterday. If somebody like Visa or MasterCard would have been the front runner on that project right, exactly. with the entire alliance behind them and Facebook being one of those members, right. now we're in a, now we've got a coalition that's really a... I wrote an article recently where basically it was that, that Libra was sunk before it was actually able to get going because of Facebook's reputation. Yeah. And they should have, the Libra Association should have known that. Should have known that and then delegated somebody in a better position, especially you could put a, put a charity up front. You know, right. I don't even know. You could put exactly. any American Red Cross could be part of the association and they'll start taking donations in cryptocurrencies because who knows what. But I just, I could see a lot of little things that would have been a lot better than the bad monster of Facebook, Facebook being the right. face, you know. Right, so. right. But, and, but like you said, it would work. As far as a currency it would. in and of itself, especially, especially when you think that Facebook has 2.6 billion users. That's more users than most countries have people. Right. And all, I think there isn't a country that There's has more than, is there right? one? Yeah, yeah. I, right, exactly. So, so you think that you have potentially that many users of a currency other than a national currency with a product that's already widely accepted you know and generationally accepted too we don't really have to teach our grandparents that much they about messenger they're pretty comfortable with it messenger, so right. the idea of sending currency within the messenger app isn't too abstract to them or isn't too foreign right but you're right it's reputational well, so, optics, yeah. optics optics matter yes very right. much so. and this is what this is what we're learning from the whole libra fiasco so do you think something like libra happens in the future it, it will yeah um and I, I believe that social media is going to play a huge part in it mm -hmm. because of how many people are already using social media right. platforms. It just can't be one with such a tainted reputation. It's not going to stop. It's just right. going to keep going. It's going to keep going. Yeah. It, it, it eventually, is, eventually, maybe we'll forgive what Facebook did. Maybe. I, I personally, I hope that we move away from Facebook into something like Facebook. De decentralized, though. Oh, And yeah, on the blockchain. And that's, yeah, I think it'll be that eventually. Like a site like Minds. Minds is similar. Yeah, I don't yeah, like Minds as much just because we get to find one that we like. The UI is fun, but also there's incentive to put it on the blockchain. And that might be through a monetary reason. I mean, sure. what's the ad revenue for Facebook right now? It's got to be astronomical, yeah, right? Yeah. What if that ad revenue was divided amongst all the users of the platform with a small percentage being allocated to whoever is running the actual site on the blockchain or running the actual website? You know? Right. True. While all the documents, everything's on the blockchain, it's all decentralized. And now all the currency that's created within the system is going back to us as the users. So yeah. that's what I really, I like about the future. And 
and decentralization in it. So, and I hope Tron does that with the DApp space, you know, where we're able to, all these things, these, these applications, Facebook, Twitter, Ubers, everything, they're on the blockchain in the form of decentralized apps. Nice. Now, are you, you bring up Tron, which is a, a very popular platform. Um, it is. <laughs> Depends <laughs> who you on. ask. Um, can you give me a little bit about what, what, how you're working with Tron? Like, what's the uh, relationship that you've developed? Right. I, it, it was friendly for the last six months just because the DAP Space Association and mine in them. And so through those, I met them at just networking events. And at those networking events, I, I conveyed the desire to want to be involved in the team. I definitely want to be on the project. But I'm not a technical guy. I'm, you know, I don't have a lot to offer technically, and I don't want to move to San Francisco either. Right. So um, it kind of came to the point where I organized a local community event in Atlanta, and it was pitched towards not just blockchain people, but anybody in the entrepreneur space interested in this new technology. So it was mostly non-coiners, and and it turned out really well. You know, we had like 100 people come. Sean uh, sponsored the event, and I kind of just put it on and organized it for them. And through that, we've kind of built a relationship towards this education platform. And I think the idea is two to three events a month. Um, I'm pitching for Uruguay in December to go speak there and on stage, but present, presenting for the DAP space in Spanish. Right. And so hopefully that goes well. And if that does like it's supposed to, then they want to start the tour in Latin America. Nice. And that will be the future is educating, you know, elite schools in, in South American countries. Go to Buenos Aires, go to Lima, go to Quito, and really try to make a presence within their, their communi communities. Nice. Well, Quinn, thank you so much for spending the time with Thanks me. Thanks for having me, Jason. Take care. I appreciate care. it. Always. Every, everyone, you can find Quinn on Twitter at Mid Earth Crypto. Thank you, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.